Welcome to the Three Minute Podcast. I'm John Brolin, editor of the twice monthly newsletter of the Healing American Healthcare Coalition. Joining me once again is Ed Eichhorn, the coalition's co-founder and co-author of Healing American Healthcare, a plan to provide quality care to all while saving one trillion a year. Hi, John. Ed, nice to have you back. Actually, today we'll be discussing the third March issue because so much happened this month. But together, Ed and I have nearly a century of healthcare experience, and we're still trying to figure it out. It's really complicated. You can find our background and contact information at the end of the podcast. We launched the Three Minute Read last March to summarize some of the critical issues affecting busy clinicians and physicians as we all struggle through the pandemic. The article summaries in this third March issue look at COVID-19 weight gain, the value of pharmaceutical oversight, the impact of the American Rescue Plan Act on the number of uninsured Americans, and an argument that the patient should be at the center of every healthcare decision. So let's dig into the latest news. Our first article is entitled, Stay at Home Orders Linked to Weight Gain. It was written by Jeff Minard, a contributing writer at MedPage today on March 22nd. A study led by Gregory Marcus, MD, at the University of California, San Francisco, found that Americans gained weight at a rate of about 1.5 pounds per month after being told to stay out of public places. The authors noted, quote, it is important to recognize the unintended health consequences shelter in place can have on a population level. During the initial surge of COVID-19 cases in the U.S., 45 different state governments issued various shelter-in-place orders in March and April of 2020. Those were intended to slow the transmission of the disease. In the study that the UCSF did, 269 participants from 37 different states and D.C. reported their weight measurements from their Fitbit or iHealth smart scale. So basically, these are folks who already were looking to stay fit. Nonetheless, they all gained weight to varying degrees during the study period. Dr. Marcus said the weight gain problem may persist even after shelter-in-place restrictions have been lifted. Our take on it, well, in our last issue, uh, we covered the World Obesity Foundation's report, and we saw the connection between the increased risk of severe COVID-19 cases with uh, death and higher body weight. There was a study that we cited that found that obese people were twice as likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 and six times more likely to die after developing the disease. When asked for comments about the study, here's what Dr. Marcus had to say, and I'll quote. Our study wasn't equipped to determine the specific reasons why individuals experienced weight gain during shelter in place but it's reasonable to assume much of it was related to lack of physical activity, plus possibly more constant accessibility to food while working from home. So snacking on the job was also a contributory factor. And now all of us uh, who sent children off to college are, are all too familiar with the so-called freshman 15 weight gain. However, the COVID-19 weight gain is much more dangerous as we've learned from several studies. The second article we summarized was FDA panel says risk of Pfizer pain drug outweighs the benefits. And it was published in STAT, written by Damien Gard on March 25th. Now, we're all aware of the need for non-addictive alternatives to opioids for pain management. But recently a panel of expert advisors to the FDA voted 19 to one to reject Pfizer's application to approve tenuzumab which is a non-addictive injectable painkiller given every two months. And they concluded that its risks might outweigh its benefits. Tenuzumab is an investigational monoclonal antibody. It's a new class of medicines called nerve growth factor inhibitors. There are roughly 31 million Americans who suffer from osteoarthritis, 11 million of them with moderate to severe osteoarthritis. So that's the population that Pfizer was targeting because for many of these with severe osteoarthritis, They've exhausted all manner of pain relief and pain management protocols. So they have proposed a post-approval plan was they wanted to get the drug approved. And then they had a plan that they would use to mitigate risk for patients with moderate to severe osteoarthritis. The drug that was developed to relieve osteoarthritis pain does have a link to some rare but serious cases of joint damage. 
in one of their studies at a high dosage, uh, roughly one out of every 100 patients had deterioration of bone in the joints. And that's uh, certainly something that is an undesirable outcome. So the FDA is unlikely to overrule its expert panel. I think we can all agree that the search for a safe, effective, and non-addictive alternative to opioids remains as elusive as the Holy Grail. Someday, soon, let's hope, sooner rather than later, we'll find one. But apparently, tenuzumab does not fill that bill. The third article we summarized was, quote, Fauci, AstraZeneca needs to straighten out vaccine data. It was written by Sarah Overmole in Politico on March 23rd, and it dealt with the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. Just hours after AstraZeneca announced that its vaccine was 79% effective, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases Data Safety and Monitoring Board, DSMB, expressed concern that AstraZeneca had included, quote, outdated information. NIAID Director Dr. Anthony Fauci oversees the Data Safety and Monitoring Board that assesses trial results and ratifies the board's decisions but he's not directly involved in his assessment. Here's what he had to say. He said that the DSMB felt that the data released, quote, might in fact be misleading a bit and wanted them, AstraZeneca, to straighten it out. The company agreed to set things right soon and later confirmed 76% effectiveness. So 79% was a slight overstatement. What both of these instances reinforce the need for is independent governmental oversight of the pharmaceutical industry. Unfortunately, that fox can't be trusted to guard its chicken coop and self-regulate. Pfizer's application for approval of a drug that was then deemed too risky and AstraZeneca's faulty claim of 79% effectiveness for its vaccine, those kinds of things shouldn't happen. Uh, some drug companies, notably Merck in several instances, actually withdrew drugs from trials when they find unacceptable risks that exceed the benefits. Others just can't be trusted. Unfortunately, drug makers cannot be trusted to place patient safety above profits. The next article is one of Ed's, that Ed's going to talk about. Any concluding comments before we move into the uh, insurance information? Uh, no, I, I think it's just very interesting that we have to deal with the weight gain during the uh, pandemic. And and it's something that we all need to uh, think about in that the number of people in the United States that are severely obese has grown. And uh, for overall health beyond the pandemic, as a nation, we need to lose a little bit of weight. And uh, that will help to make all of us a little bit healthier uh, as we move along. And I think uh, we'll probably see more information about that as the pandemic uh, hopefully winds down in the fall. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, even prior to the pandemic, the U.S. was one of the most obese nations in the world. That World Obesity Foundation report had the U.S. at 36.2% of adults over 18 uh, who were obese in 2016. So that's pre-pandemic. I can't imagine what the numbers must look like now. Mm. Well, let's talk about the next article. This one is entitled, Biden Extends Health Insurance Marketplace Through the Summer. And it's by Chelsea Ceruzzo. And it was written uh, for US News and World Report and published on the 23rd of March. Uh, she reported that the Biden administration has extended open enrollment through August 15th for the 36 states that expanded Medicare eligibility 10 years ago or 11 years ago when the uh, Affordable Care Act was passed. Originally, uh, this deadline was extended to February 15th and then extended once again to May 15th and now it's been extended to August 15th. And the reason for that is people need to have the time to think about taking advantage of the savings that may be available to them under the American Rescue Plan Act, which include things like subsidized health insurance premiums for people with incomes under 150% of the federal poverty level. Also limiting uh, health care premiums to eight and a half percent of income for people who earn incomes up to 400 percent of the federal poverty level. Let's just uh, note what those levels are. The federal poverty level uh, for a single earner is $19,140 uh, per year and for a family it's $39,300 a year. 
and 400% of the federal poverty level is $51,040 a year for a single earner and $104,800 for a family income. The White House also estimates that premiums will decrease by an average of $50 per month and one in four enrollees will be able to upgrade their plans to get better out of pocket costs at comparable or lower premiums as a result of the plan. The next article that I will cover is also about the plan and it is entitled, Will the American Rescue Plan Reduce the Number of Uninsured Americans? And it's by Sarah Collins and Gabriella Eblafia. The Commonwealth Fund published the article on the 22nd of March. They point out in their article that the American Rescue Plan Act is the most extensive health insurance improvement since the Affordable Care Act was passed 11 years ago. They cited the statistics of the uninsured in our country. They said there are approximately 30 million uninsured Americans today, and they broke this number down as followed based on data from 2019. 14.9 million Americans are eligible for subsidized plans or may have an offer of employer coverage. Of these, 11.2 million are eligible for subsidized coverage, and 3.6 million had incomes that were too high to qualify for subsidies. 6.4 million are eligible for Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program, but are not enrolled. Another 4.8 million have incomes below the poverty level and live in Medicaid non-expansion states. And there are 3.1 million undocumented immigrants and they do not qualify for coverage as a part of the plan. The authors pointed out that surveys report that affordability is the most frequent uh, cited reason that eligible uninsured people do not roll in marketplaces uh, for. And many of those who are eligible for subsidies or Medicaid are not aware of their eligibility or they face confusing rules to get their coverage. The plan also provides temporary subsidies for people who lost their jobs and their coverage this year with zero premium plans if they have filed for unemployment by the end of September of 2021. The plan addresses the affordability issue for many Americans However, the subsidy support is temporary and only available for the next two years. For this reason, the Congressional Budget Office projects the increased financial support of the plan will result in reducing the number of uninsured by only 2.5 million because of its temporary nature. The authors recommend policy changes that the Congress and the Biden administration could implement that could increase coverage. They believe that making the subsidy plans permanent would go a long way towards increasing participation. They also suggest that we should allow people with incomes below the poverty level uh, to register if they live in the non-expansion states. They also believe that we should fully fund advertising and outreach and support to help the uninsured enroll. When the plan was originally written, it had navigators in the plan. The navigator's job is to help people who want to register for insurance to find the plan they are either eligible for or the best plan for them. They also encourage uh, enrollment by just simplifying the plan choices that people have. They recommend offering a public plan and allow people with employer provided coverage to choose the public plan instead of the employer plan if they would prefer that. An Urban Institute study reported that these policy changes could expand coverage to all Americans, but there would be an annual cost of $122 to $161 billion to provide this universal coverage. There are two things that we think the Biden administration needs to do. First, it should make the public aware of the subsidies and other programs that can provide them with coverage under the plan. Universal coverage, however, could be provided by the plan we proposed in our book called the Icorn Hutchinson All Care Plan without increasing government expense. Thank you, Ed. The uh, American Rescue Plan Act uh, certainly contains the biggest expansion of the Affordable Care Act uh, since it was enacted back in 2010. 
kind of a stealth way of getting more coverage to more people. Uh, the timing uh, is interesting because the two years run out immediately after the 2022 elections. So next year's elections should be very interesting. Uh, you know, once people get a benefit, they don't like having a benefit taken away. So it's going to make for a very interesting political year in 2022. What do you think, well, Ed? That's why we think it's important uh, for people to begin to consider plans like the one we offered in our book, right. because the federal deficit, although people are willing to extend it over and over again, has gotten extremely large based on both the recent tax cut of 2019 and all of the expenses that are uh, really necessary to defeat the pandemic. So uh, we're hoping that plans like ours that actually could provide universal coverage without increase in uh, federal spending and actually you might decrease federal spending a little bit uh, ought to garner more support in uh, a time like this right offering a public option that forces uh, the for-profit insurers to compete on a more level playing field is uh, it's probably still a long shot but that's one way to get the job done agreed the final article that we summarized is one that resonated with me uh, and it was written by Carrie Owen and Pleats in Modern Healthcare as a commentary on March 22nd, which happens to be their last weekly issue. They're now moving to a twice monthly issue. It was entitled Healthcare Leaders Can't Go Wrong If We Keep the Patient at the Center of Every Decision. Carrie Owen Pleats is the incoming chair of the American College of Healthcare Executives. She's also her full time day job is as president of Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, one of the largest health systems in the country. Her commentary is a reflection on integrity, and most of these are quotes directly from her commentary. Quote, the fundamental value that is one of our profession's most essential attributes, and one of the reasons why I chose to spend most of my career in healthcare. Noting that, quote, it has been critical in our ability to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, she calls for, quote, reaffirming our own commitment to professional integrity. Ms. Bleets equates the meaning of integrity with advice she received from her mentor. Uh, she was told by him, if you make every decision with the patient at the center of that decision, you'll never make a bad decision. So healthcare leaders should, quote, work intentionally every day on maintaining ethical standards in every decision, communication, huddle, and personal interaction, end quote. Quote, in the same way high reliability organizations hold safety huddles, Start each meeting with a mission moment and talk about the good catches. Well, it's not easy to take the high road in all cases each and every day. What she recommends is, quote, remaining centered on what is best for the patient and letting it guide our decisions and our relationships with our teams and communities is our North Star. We agree wholeheartedly. Uh, her sound advice really resonated with me. Uh, uh, fortunate to have served on several hospital boards, including one currently where every meeting begins with a safety story and decisions are reached through the prism of what's the best for the patients that we serve and the communities that we serve. It surely stands in dramatic contrast to the response taken by the Trump White House coronavirus response team. Uh, we actually did the article in the summary prior to last Sunday's CNN documentary called COVID War, The Pandemic Doctors Speak Out. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who is uh, CNN's chief medical expert, conducted a wide-ranging interview with the, the doctors who were a part of the White House coronavirus response team during the Trump administration. Some of the revelations were, at least to me, shocking. Uh, Dr. Deborah Burks, uh, who we saw choke up when Trump talked about uh, taking hydroxychloroquine to beat the pandemic, uh, she said that although the first 100,000 deaths that America experienced were unavoidable, I quote her, the rest of them in my mind could have been mitigated or decreased substantially. Then she added, quote, the majority of people in the White House did not take this seriously. Uh, Dr. Brett Girard, the nation's coronavirus testing chief under Trump, admitted, quote, when we said there were millions of tests available, there weren't. There were components of the test available, but not the full deal. End quote. And then former director of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, said that Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar personally tried to change scientific reports that the White House didn't like, namely the CDC longstanding and well-trusted mortality and morbidity report that's issued weekly. 
Of course, former Secretary Azar denies Dr. Redfield's assertion. So whatever the ultimate truth, it's clear that the Trump administration's failure to take the pandemic seriously resulted in well over 100,000 avoidable American deaths. Now, Ed and I have been tracking uh, the OECD's fatality rates since last April, the first full month of the pandemic uh, under the WHO declaration. As of March 31st, here's where America stands. If the U.S. had merely matched the OECD's average fatality rate per 100,000 of 119.3, 157,000 more of us would be alive today. That's the OECD average. If we had matched Germany's performance, 250,000 more of us would be alive today. If we had matched the five Scandinavian countries, including Sweden, who fumbled and bumbled at the start, 339,000 more Americans would be alive today. And closer to home, if we had just merely matched our neighbor to the north, Canada, 350,000 more of us would be alive today. Shame on the Trump coronavirus response team. Thank you. Ed, any final comments? I think you made some very good points in that data. It's really important to, for us to keep this in mind. And we grow complacent because we hear uh, of a report of another 1,000 people today or another 800 people today who have passed away. But if uh, we had done the things uh, of mitigation that our CDC recommended, that other nations did, the results would be more palatable than they have been because of the lack of direction that uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta reported on in the uh, CNN report that you referenced. So I, I think we just uh, need to keep our proverbial eye on the ball and keep moving forward in a way that protects more Americans and prevents more deaths as um, the vaccine rolls out and, and more and more people are in a position to um, resume their normal lives because they've gotten the vaccine that will protect them. So thanks for bringing that up. I think it was really important information. Thank you, Ed. Uh, we still have a survey out there that we'd love to have you take. Click on www.healingamericanhealthcare.org and take that brief survey. In future podcasts will continue to share feedback with our listeners on the key issues that include universal health care versus Medicare for all, the icorn hutchinson all care plan, prescription drug pricing, and others. If there are issues of particular interest that you would like to see us cover, feel free to contact us. Here's our contact information. And if you'd like to be on our mailing list, just text Heal Healthcare to 22828 to get started. And until next time, wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear a mask. Thank you all. And on May 1st, make sure you go out there and get your vaccine. <laughs>